Good evening, everyone. I would like to call this meeting to order. Thank you to all of those attending in person tonight and those staying engaged by watching our recording at a later time. The public is reminded that if they wish to speak during community comment, they will need to fill out a speaker form located in a lobby on the table and turn it in to Board Secretary Kim Colvin seated at the end on my left. Comments will take place during the designated community comment portion of our agenda. Before we dive into agenda, I wanna take a few minutes to introduce those at the table with us. <laughs> to my right, we have Superintendent Degner, Directors Pilcher Hyatt, East Ham, Vice President Williams. To my left, we have Directors Abraham, Clausen, Finch, and Board Secretary Kim Colvin. First item on the agenda is approval of tonight's agenda. I move approval of the agenda for tonight. Is there a second? Second. Kim, we're ready to vote. Mm -hmm. Online voting is open. I'm an I vote, Kim. Thank you, Director Clausen. I'm an I too, Kim. Thank you, Director Williams. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thank you. Next on the agenda is the Education Showcase, which is our all state music recognition, one of my favorite items. And I will turn it over to, state your name, I'm sorry. Hi, I'm Diana Hawley. <laughs> thank you, I'm, welcome. Yeah, thank you. So good evening, my name is Diana Hawley and I am new to the role of K-12 Music Coordinator this year in the district. After serving um, since 2009 as a general music teacher in several buildings and as an instructional coach of innovation. I'm here tonight to introduce the Iowa City students that were selected to participate in this year's Iowa High School Music Association's All-State Music Festival. The All-State Music Festival draws the top band, choir, and orchestra students from the nearly 300 high schools across the straight state through a competitive audition process. Only the most high achieving high school musicians are selected. Earlier this month, our students took part in two days of rehearsals and a culminating performance at Iowa State's Hilton Coliseum. The ICCSD was exceptionally well represented in Ames this year with an off the charts number of participants, 85 students from City, Liberty and West High Schools. But before we celebrate our students um, who have met their talents um, with incredible focus, drive and commitment, I'd like to acknowledge, and the excuse me, acknowledge the dedication of our exceptional high school teachers who have gone above and beyond investing their time and talents to support the efforts of our students on top of their regular responsibilities. It's an honor to work with each one of them. I'd also like to express gratitude to the Music Auxiliary for providing financial support towards registration and lodging for students and teachers, district leadership, and the school board for your continued support of our K-12 general and performance music programs, and of course for the other 50 or so elementary and junior high music teachers that work with intention every day to provide musical encounters that are engaging, accessible, and differentiated so that all of our students experience belonging in our music spaces while simultaneously providing fertile ground for those with remarkable aptitude and drive in music so that they may flourish and excel. Um, perhaps most of all, we'd like to thank the parents and caregivers that are here tonight. The, these accomplishments absolutely reflect your commitment to your child's music education, and we thank you for all that you do to support music in the Iowa City Schools. Though tonight we celebrate a small subsection of our students from our flagship ensembles, behind the scenes we as a music team are doing the work to provide equitable opportunities in music for all students in the Iowa City Schools. We strive to foster music-centered communities where students experience a sense of belonging as they develop lifelong connections with and through music. Our programs are central to a well-rounded education. Iowa City is a community that values the arts and our schools have a reputation across the state and region as being a leader in music education. Thank you for your <coughs> continued support. And I'll, we'll start off with Mike Coble and Aaron Otmar with City High Band. Good evening. Thank you so much for all of your support of the fine arts in our district. I just wanted to say that up front. Very, very appreciative of all that you do. My name is Aaron Otmar, one of the band directors at City High School. We are very fortunate to have 14 students who are selected into the Iowa All-State Band and Orchestra, in addition to some alternates. And our first student is Matisse Arnoni. Our next student who is selected is Max Berry Stoltz. 
Our next student who couldn't be here tonight is Liv Lehman. Our next student is Linus McRoberts, who was selected as an alternate. Our next student who couldn't be here tonight is Marcus Miller, also selected as an alternate. Our next student is Lily Moninger. Our next student, Oliver Palmer, who couldn't be here tonight. Our next student was Ben Platt. Our next student is Molly Reapy. Our next student is Monique Schneblin, who is also a four-year All-Stater. A very, very big accomplishment. Our next student who couldn't be here tonight is Ella Sherlock. Our next student was Alan Tallman. Our next student selected as an alternate was Olivia Vandenberg. And our last student who was selected as an alternate was Seth Yoder. The City High Band All-Staters and Alternates. Thank you very much. Next, we'll invite Ryan Arp to introduce Liberty High Band. Hello. Uh, we'd like to take this time to thank all of our um, feeder programs that also work to make all these all-state students happen. It's not just the high school teachers that are part of our music students, but our elementary teachers as well as our junior high teachers uh, for all their contributions to make these all-state musicians. Uh, from Liberty, we have uh, four students, and we had Victoria Akis on the bass clarinet, Luke Gage on clarinet, his third year, both of these were third year All-Staters, by the way. Uh, then we had Tommy Rogers, first year All-State percussion. And then we had Lucy Walker, first year on oboe, the Liberty All-States. Next, we'll have Rob Med introducing our West High Band delegates. And once again, thank you very much for this opportunity to recognize these students' accomplishments. Um, really appreciate that. And I would also like to introduce my colleague, Ryan Middleton, uh, who also works with our students at West High in the band program. Um, and, it, you know, it's sometimes we, we hear about, uh, we have, must have a lot of talent in Iowa City. Um, and we do. But when this happens so that we have the most number of All-Staters year after year after year, uh, it says a lot about the teaching that goes on in our, in our band programs, our, our orchestra programs and choir programs, as well as our uh, general music programs at the elementary. And that is uh, the strength of those, that teaching and our programs um, it is very much supported by you and we really appreciate that. We had uh, West High, we had 17 uh, band members uh, designated as All-Staters this year. Um, and as you might guess, these are very busy, busy students. Um, and we have a play going on this week and a number of the students involved in that, as well as swim meet and uh, writing college essays and other things. So we do have some students that are not here tonight, <coughs> I apologize. Um, our first one is Sam Abdel Malik, who's a sophomore trumpet player, is his first year as Allstate, um, and he's in Florida tonight. <laughs> um, our next is Isabel Sainer, a sophomore horn player in her first year as an Allstate. Uh, Kyle Chi is swimming tonight, but he's a swimmer, or I'm sorry, he's a senior uh, trumpet player in his third year as a, an Allstater and was principal in the orchestra on the trumpet section. Uh, next, Henry Dye is a senior alto saxophone player. This is his first year as an Allstater. We have Caleb Davies, who is a freshman on clarinet in his first year as Allstate. Uh, next, we have another senior, Heidi Dew, who's a clarinet player. As a three-year All-Stater, um, she is involved in the play. Uh, an another three-year All-Stater, Ava Garcia. She's a junior trumpet player, not able to be here tonight. And next we have J.D. Denninger, a senior horn player. It's a first-year All-Stater. Um, Next, a senior trumpet player and a second year All-Stater, Sachiko Goto. Mm -hmm. 
We have uh, sophomore Claire Hahn, who's a second year oboe player in the Allstate. Designated as a clarinet alternate was a junior Florence He Yu. We have a senior, Damian Kim, tenor sax player, and third year Allstate player. Um, sophomore Claire Lauder, Lawler is a clarinet player, a second year Allstater, also involved in the play. Next, Audrey Parrish is a senior trumpet player. Patrick Selby, a junior trombone player, not able to be here tonight. Lydia Shin is a senior trombone player, also involved in the play. And finally, our um, four-year Allstater, Sophia Wang, senior flute player, also not able to be here tonight. Thank you. Be Tyler Hagee with City High Choir. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'd like to echo the thanks of my colleagues uh, for the support in this district of the fine arts uh, and certainly of uh, us in the performing arts. Um, we are so grateful uh, for the um, love that you show us uh, and for um, the support both in terms of uh, finances and facilities um, that allow us to, to cultivate some of the best programs uh, in this state. Uh, we were fortunate enough to have two uh, choir members selected this year for the All-State Chorus. The first is Adam Bibb Bentley. Uh, and our second uh, selected student this year is Sarah Brenneman. Thank you again for inviting us here. We look forward to seeing you next year. Now from Liberty, we have Rob Williams and Judy Shell Duncan introducing their choir delegates. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for all of the support um, in our facilities, for um, providing us the staffing that we need to create great experiences for our kids. They have worked so hard all year long in all of our activities, not just Allstate, and we're incredibly proud of everything that they've been able to accomplish. Uh, so this year we had 15 students selected from Liberty High School uh, from our choir department. Uh, Owen Abel, tenor two, Lauren Ajax, alto one, Aiden Decker, tenor two, Dylan Eyestone, tenor two, Claire Hibbard, soprano two, Alex Hoffman, bass one, Reagan Hansen, alto one, Tegan Kill, alto two, Manuela Lira, alto one, Toby Schoen, bass two, Addie Siddig, soprano two, Miriam Terwilliger, soprano two, Tom Vivibacher, soprano one, Lauren Votes, tenor one, and Grace Walker, tenor one. Our Liberty All-State students. John Welch is going to step in and speak for his choir colleagues from West High. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, John Welch. I'm the orchestra director of West High. Uh, David uh, Haas is unable to be here this evening, and his student uh, Joseph Alarape is uh, at a show choir rehearsal this evening, so they're both uh, occupied. Um, but on behalf of David and West High Choir, Joseph Alarape. Thank you. with our orchestra teachers, we'll have Megan Stuckey Swanson from City. Hi, thank you very much uh, for taking time out of your evening and recognizing all of these amazing students. I know listening to 85 names um, without context uh, is probably a little difficult, um, but uh, all of the directors can attest that uh, dozens upon dozens of hours have gone into preparing for this event and for the festival if they were accepted. And so um, all of these students have uh, um, are so high achieving and just deserve the utmost um, acknowledgement and respect. So thank you for taking time. Um, I have the privilege of announcing 14 um, uh, City High Orchestra students. Um, a lot of us have rehearsals tonight, so uh, we're a little sparse in attendance, but 
Um, Adrian Boschen's not here, but he's one of our four-year All-Staters. Um, Isaac Bullwinkle, also not here. Um, Leo Burchett, Ty Caputo, Lucy Carice Carlson, Marina S. Kendell, Esther Pewterball, Sebastian Souter, Kalia Seaton, Thomas Shea, Abigail Sigafus, Henry Smith, Greta Stanier, and Adam Zeithamel, who is also a four year All Stater. Just say hi. Savage with Liberty Orchestra. Thank you for having us this evening. We were proud to uh, take Marcus Brintle, Xavier Oberfell, William Turnus, and Grace Wang. And this is Marcus and Grace are with us tonight. Thank you. And last but not least, we have John Welch and the West High Orchestra students. Hi again, everybody. Uh, my name is John Welch. I'm the orchestra director uh, at Iowa City West High, uh, obviously Iowa City. Um, and just want to say, uh, I know that my colleague Rob had said something like this too, but just um, thank you for having us. I, I, I really mean that. I know that there's a lot going on with the district um, at all times. There, there are just so many things that you all are dealing with um, that it's, it's just wonderful to be able to celebrate the hard work that's going on and the successes that are happening here because of the vision that we have here in this district to have music education as part of our curriculum. Um, and, and, and just, uh, we get to, uh, you get to see all the high school directors tonight, but there's a whole lot of work that's going on here in our community um, from our feeder programs uh, at the fifth and sixth grade level to the junior highs and all the way throughout. So we're very fortunate to be able to come up here and to say these names um, and to take a lot of credit. Um, but there's a lot of work that's happening here. And I just want to um, say while we're here, thank you for your continued support. And I just encourage you to, to, to keep doing what you can do to keep these wonderful programs as vibrant as they are. Um, I, uh, Diana had, had sent me an email earlier uh, asking about um, something that I wrote in a speech last year whenever I was in her position. And I don't know, I didn't get to hear it, Diana, so if I'm reemphasizing it, uh, I want to say it again. Uh, what you're seeing here is the most by one single district, all staters, that have been success, or that have been accepted uh, this year. And this is something that happens annually. And this is something I just think is really important for us to celebrate. And again, um, thank you, because it's because of your support um, from all the administrators that are here in this room, along with the board. So again, thank you so much. Um, we had a number of conflicts tonight with West High. We have a, a show that's opening up tomorrow, a show choir rehearsal that you heard, a lot of athletic uh, events going on and a whole bunch of lessons. So I had a lot of students coming up to me saying they were unable to be here, but we do have a handful that are here. Um, but I'll still read their uh, names anyhow. So um, we'll start with uh, Andrew Chen, violin, uh, Nathan Chen, violin, Maya Chu, violin, uh, Andrew Dong, violin, Sabrina Du, violin. Jonathan Fan, violin. Um, want to note that he is a four-year member, uh, which is a tremendous accomplishment. Uh, Tina Hong, uh, violin. Sophia Jin is here, violin. Uh, Christian Kim, violin. Jesse Lee, violin. Anjali Lode, violin. Esther Park, violin. Tessa Rippentrop, cello. Yuning Shao, violin. Anna Song, violin. Mac Wilson, uh, string bass. Uh, Horam Wu, Viola and Haran is here and want to acknowledge that he is indeed a four-year uh, All-Stater, a tremendous honor. Uh, Ming Yang was our uh, alternate. And then lastly, we have Fora Zhu. So thank you all so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let's give our students another round of applause. And congratulations again to um, all of the proud parents and guardians that was able to join us tonight, as well as the band directors. We definitely appreciate you all coming out to celebrate such glowing achievements. Next on the agenda, 
would be community comment, but we do not have any. So I will move on to consent agenda. Are there any items that directors would like to have pulled from tonight's consent agenda? I need, I need to pull um, 11. Okay. Uh, item 11, DOJ extension agreement. Are there any other items? Seeing none, Kim, I think we'll, oh, no, is there a motion <laughs> to approve tonight's consent agenda minus item 11? I move to approve tonight's consent agenda minus item 11. Second. Second. All right, Kim, there's a motion now and a second. We're ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thank you. Um, Vice President Williams, you asked that we pull item 11. I have a conflict and I need to just abstain from voting on that one. Okay. Are there any discussion outside of that conflict? If not, I would entertain a motion. I move approval of item 11 on the consent agenda. Second. Cam, we're ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with directors Claussen, Malone, Eastham, Finch, Pilcher Hayek and Abraham voting yay and director Williams abstaining. Thank you. Next is policy review, and we have several different items, and I don't know if uh, <coughs> committee chairperson, Director Finch, I, would like I to take, take over. I can take a stab at it. Thank, thank you, President Malone. Um, tonight we reviewed, uh, again for the second time, the 200 series, um, and that's coming up for a vote later this evening. Uh, 300 and 400 series, there were no changes in our primary discussion was on the policy primers. All of us were there tonight, so I really don't need to update anyone. I don't know if uh, Superintendent Digner would like to say anything about that. I don't have a lot either. Director Finch uh, did a nice job of summarizing what we did in PNG. Uh, she did reference that some of these policies are going to come back to you for approval, the 200, the open enrollment, um, and the student fundraising policy. This would be the second reading of those. It's your second opportunity to see it and for the public to see it, and then you'll move uh, hopefully for approval here later in the meeting. The other ones are there for your first reading. Okay, great. So seeing that that's all with that, we can move on to the discussion item, which is preschool update. And Superintendent Degner, is that you or? Uh, Director Reedy's gonna uh, take that presentation for us. Uh, Ashley's gonna talk to you a little bit here about preschool and just kind of where we've been at. You remember last spring we talked about a couple pilot programs uh, to do the full day wrap at uh, Shimmick and Wickham Elementary and so we wanted to update you a little bit on that and talk about some uh, potential plans moving forward or answer any questions you might have and just revisit that topic as, as we continue to uh, track progress on that this school year. Yes, thank you for your time this evening. Um, a lot of this is just updates on current enrollment numbers. Um, we were um, intentional about the numbers we were able to provide just because of um, making sure we're protecting our student information specific to our entitled students and our students who uh, participate in child care assistance. But it is important to note that as um, a district, we are all inclusive in our preschool programming, which means we serve all students. And so you'll see highlighted in our slides here um, that we uh, have our total enrollment numbers pulled as of November 1st. These numbers are always fluid, as you know, but we are currently sitting at about 589 students, which does include our part community partner student enrollment numbers, and you can see the breakdown there um, of AM and PM. And then you'll see our on-site enrollment information. So we have 17 school-based uh, sites, many of which have both AM and PM sessions. Uh, we have two sites, Hills and Twain, that are shared visions programming. Um, so that's a full day offering through a grant. 
Um, and then our RAP pilot program sites are at Shimmick and at Wickham. And we have both AM and PM sessions operating there. So you can see the enrollment reflected there. This is our community partner enrollment. We currently partner with six community partners. Um, we also have a uh, memorandum that you have had reviewed earlier this year with uh, HACAP for our Twain and Lucas sites, which is holding eight students, eight slots at each of those sites for students who would qualify. And then, as um, Mr. Dagner, Superintendent Dagner had said, we have uh, two pilot sites, Shimmick and Wickham, and then Hills is our shared vision site where we are also piloting the Champions RAP site. Um, and so you can see the enrollment information broken down there. Any questions? Uh, can you let us know anything about the interest of uh, parents in the Hill, Shimmick, and Twain, uh, I'm sorry, Hill, Shimmick, and uh, uh, Wickham programs? Uh? Yeah, I, I think as you can see, um, our enrollment, our student enrollment numbers, um, so to provide context, uh, we are, our enrollment numbers sit at 15, because we typically retain five for entitled students. Um, we, can staff, we can staff up to 20 students per session per the state guidelines. And so you see in our enrollment numbers, those preschool sites that have RAP um, offerings. Uh, Wickham has 20 in the morning, so they're completely full and 14 in the afternoon, and that is because we are also holding some entitled spots. And then at um, Shimmick, excuse me, we have 19, so just one slot opening, and then 11. And so uh, I do, in Shimmick, as you'll remember, that PM session was a very late add, so I do contribute that to why we see lesser enrollment there is because that was actually added after the school year started in October. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, Really, I do feel like we've gotten very good feedback. Um, we know in our community that having an opportunity to bring your child to school prior to the school day starting, having your child access high quality educational programming, and then having care until you can pick them up is a continued need. So we've gotten great feedback and we're excited to continue to see where this goes. Thanks very much. I just wanna highlight two brief things on this slide. So the reason that we had added the second um, room at Shimmick or the second section was because of demand, correct? We had a long enough wait list that, that we, we were able to. So I think that speaks to how popular the program is. And then the other part of that second to last slide um, that I wanna highlight is the asterisk at the bottom. We have families accessing childcare assistance at both Shimmick and Wickham. And so what we've been able to do is create more CCA slots in Johnson County, which is really, if you don't know about it, it may not seem like a big deal, but it's a really big deal. Um, and it's something that I think that we as a district should be proud. It's, it's often hard for private providers to um, have CCA slots available because of the reimbursement rates. Uh, but we're able to create those for our most neediest families in the community. And I'm really proud of the work that you guys have done to do that. Great. Yeah, the team's done a great job with that, and I think Director Williams' point is uh, relevant there, that part of the um, exploratory model with this was being able to do that child care assistance and then intentionally starting at sites like Shimmick and Wickham so that we can figure out the funding formula to work this long term at some other sites. If you remember that, I think it was an ed committee we talked about that last year a little bit. And so uh, we feel like we're having success with it and have some good opportunities to continue to move this, this uh, program forward. Great. Are there any other questions? Yeah, real quick. So, so this is the pilot. So then, uh, there's opportunity. So, what's next? Like, what are we going to look at next year? That's a great question, and I don't think we have that determined yet. But I think we have good evidence of success that it is something we would uh, continue to look at expanding. Um, of course, there, you know, where is that? Where do we have room and capacity? We know that um, as we've talked about middle schools, some of this conversation about preschools also tied to our middle school conversation because we know that'll free up classrooms at our elementary schools to do that. So I think that'll be the next time we come back to is thinking about, okay, what is the plan for next year look like and what can we pull off in that sense? But the idea would be to continue to grow it, right? That's, that was the goal about starting these pilots and then continuing to move forward, create more seats, more wrap care, full day options for folks. And how, you know, how do we get a sense of demand like, I'm just wondering how we would gauge that. Do, is it parents coming and saying, hey, we wish you had this? I mean, is that pretty much? Yeah, I would say that um, some of the information we've gathered as we've continued to, well, have started to have these conversations is we've looked at um, the amount of child care agencies within boundaries and how many of them partner with the school or have um, 
rigorous curriculum, how many of them have kind of like extended hours. Um, so there's certainly pockets within our community where we see much greater need. Um, so as an example, North Liberty just happens to have many more childcare centers. Um, but then if you look over in our Wickham, Corville Central, Horn, like some of those areas, we do not see, uh, Weber is an area as a parent who had a preschooler there, <laughs> like there is not a lot of options. Um, and so I think part of it is being intentional with where we start to continue to enhance our, our programming. And then also, um, as uh, Director Williams said, how can we enhance and target really the intended, I think, student population that we were trying to get access to, right? So we know that we want all of our kids accessing a full, uh, a comprehensive preschool experience and having a safe and supportive environment for them in each in their day. And we feel confident we can provide that. So making it accessible and equitable is something that I really want to target. And I know that that's shared by our team. So I see that being where the conversation leads us is what's the need and how do we meet it? <laughs> Great. Great, thanks so much. Great. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda, we have a couple presentations. The first one is in Tellesi. Is that you? Yeah, I think Chase is Dr. probably going to introduce Mr. Keplinger. Sure, great. Well, good evening. Nice to see you all this evening. And if you remember at our meeting in November, we had this on the consent agenda. And that didn't provide us an opportunity to share much about it with the board. And so we ask you to table it to tonight's meeting so we could have a presentation. And that's what we're going to show you this evening. We've got Scott uh, Keplinger here to make the presentation on behalf of IntelliC. So I'd invite Scott up. Do you want me to run that for you? Or are you good oh, to stand there? And I can click it. All right. It works, so. Good. Perfect. And then he's got about a 10-minute presentation. I'll we'll just open it up to some questions and discussion from the board. Great. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, as Chase mentioned, I'm Scott Keplinger. I'm the CEO of Malum Terminus Technologies. We're a spin out of the University of Iowa. And uh, we're a startup, but we're, we're, the inspiration for our startup was actually to create safer schools. And so thank you for the time, but more importantly, thank you for what you're doing for our communities. Um, yeah, just go ahead and I should just set this up for you. We did send out a pre-read, um, but I'm here to answer any questions as well as kind of give you a summary here, uh, including a very, very brief video. It's about a minute long. It does a much better job of explaining than I do. Uh, but ultimately, what we do is we work with your existing surveillance cameras. That's very important because you've invested so many resources in those already today and we turn them from kind of reactive tools, hey, what happened? In fact, we say they don't prevent incidents, they record them, turn them into proactive tools. So now you have the situational awareness to understand, hey, I need to go prevent something. So uh, with that, why don't I go ahead and kick off this video, I think. It's an amazing video that's about a minute long. <laughs> We'll, we'll send out the link or something maybe, or do we have the... Okay, no worries. Um, ultimately, it just tells our story about, okay, look, existing surveillance cameras now track things like, unfortunately in today's environment, does somebody have a weapon? What we call from the catastrophic to the common, all the way to, hey, there's a spill on the ground, please clean that up before somebody falls. And the way that we do this. Got it might work there. Yeah. Oh, quick. did it? I got some work on mine. Okay. okay. Try this <laughs> here. Oh, there we go. Everywhere, including in the workplace. The average slip and fall claim is tens of thousands of dollars and can be millions if it goes to trial. And the cost of a workplace homicide can be catastrophic to your organization. Turn your passive surveillance cameras into proactive risk mitigation tools, protecting customers, staff, and your bottom line from harm with IntelliC's AI risk mitigation platform. Watch how quickly IntelliC alerts to a drawn gun. Using advanced AI technology, IntelliC autonomously monitors multiple video streams, maximizing your existing investment and adding another layer of protection to your security systems. Detect an ever-growing number of threats across the risk matrix for one flat rate. Everything from the common, like a slip and fall, to the catastrophic, like a drawn gun. IntelliC gives you the tools to address a wide range of threats. 
Achieve all of this with no added personnel, disruptions, or expensive system upgrades. Improve your risk profile with IntelliC's four-step approach, allowing you to monitor, detect, alert, and act faster and more efficiently than ever before. Autonomously monitor multiple cameras 24-7, 365 with a system that won't panic, call in sick, or get screen fatigue. Instantly alert your people and systems, giving them immediate situational awareness with customizable day and time alerts, giving you the ability to act quickly and intervene before a risk escalates to an incident or before an incident becomes a tragedy. When seconds matter, choose IntelliSee. Smarter surveillance for a safer world. So hopefully that does a good job of explaining what we've created here. And that voice is actually Ashley Neighbor, a former newscaster up in Cedar Rapids. So that's kind of fun. Um, what we've done is we've created uh, a software application that makes your uh, existing cameras. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, so what we what we have is you have hundreds and hundreds of existing surveillance cameras. We have a local appliance that resides within your firewall that connects to those live stream feeds. And you have then a web application that you can set up your parameters to specific to your organization. And then you set up alerts to send to other systems or to your personnel to say, hey, there's a spill over here, or be careful, there may be a weapon in this situation, and everything in between. The uh, approach that we take uh, is very important to us is it's also a private approach. So we will never do facial recognition. The system does not have facial recognition. It's cyber secure. There are no privacy issues with it because we do not retain any footage. Your employees, your staff, whomever you decide, get the alerts, and those alerts, this is a real life example, contains the timestamp, where is the situation at, the visual evidence of what's going on, and who's receiving it. And you get that in real time. Because of that, then, there's no issues with uh, FERPA or HIPAA or any of these other privacy concerns, which is very important to us, but we also know it's very important to you, um, because we don't need to know who that is. We just need to let you know that something's going on that you need to pay attention to. And that's really important because 99% plus of all video surveillance is not monitored. And what this allows then is 24-7, 365 now coverage of those cameras to detect a bunch of bad things. And in fact, the company name, Malum Terminus, I had to look it up when we invested into it. It's Latin for stopping bad, so terminating, and that's our mission. I do have some examples here um, across this risk matrix. If you're not familiar with the risk matrix, it's very common in insurance. We have a lot of uh, insurance companies working with us. What, how likely is something uh, to happen? So on one extreme would be, hey, slip and falls happen all the time or spills happen all the time. Then if it does happen, how bad is it, right? So the other extreme is hopefully you never have an active shooter situation. If it happens, it's catastrophic. And so you can see the two extremes there. But here's some examples, and I need to be very forthright too, is we've never caught a real weapon in what I call the wild. What you're seeing here are either um, active shooter drills or people testing our system. But this is an example where our objective is stop the weapon before it ever enters the building. Most of these horrible situations, the uh, assailant stages in the parking lot or stages inside the building in a stairwell or potentially a restroom. So what we want to do is stop it before it enters the building. If it enters the building, stop it before it's fired. If it's still going on, then understand where is that person. And then if the authorities need to come in, and this is horrific, um, one of the longest periods of time in a very short period is trying to find out where they are to get the good guys to find the bad guy. And that's, that's the inspiration for our system. Uh, Waukee Community School is where my kids go. They've implemented our system. Um, Iowa City has been one of the early adopters as far as working with us on what does the school need. On the other extreme are the slip and falls. So this is an example of a very high risk situation. Uh, happens to be up north of you all. Um, 
at the bottom of these concrete stairs, there's pooling water. If somebody had been walking down those stairs and hit that, that could be life altering for that person and it could be a million dollar plus claim against the organization. The root cause of this, it actually was on July 4th weekend, was a leaky roof. And through our system, that would have leaked if they did not have our system, they immediately were able to address it and they saved tens of thousands of dollars of future property damage that way as well. Other examples, this happens to be uh, in Waukee, a uh, busy, uh, busy hallway right in the middle of class or one between classes. Somebody spills, you know students, they're not gonna tell anybody. This allows operational efficiency, go clean that up. This is an example of a fall. You can see how quickly the system will activate to let people know that somebody's fallen. Very similar to weapons, our ideal situation is prevent the fall from happening in the first place. If it does happen, get help to that person immediately. That will reduce the claim, it will help somebody that maybe needs some help, it also can help prevent fraud. There's 17 fraudulent slip and fall claims a day in the United States. Okay? The same capability can also help solo workers. This is very important to us as well, this is a real life situation where a solo worker, which we all have them and it's increasing with the labor concerns, uh, has a medical issue. We know several years ago, uh, one of the schools here had an issue. This would help get that person help when they can't get help themselves. And that literally can save lives. Another situation where with trespassing detection, a well-intentioned coach let in a good student at 11 p.m. to shoot baskets by themselves, that same student then went and lifted weights by themselves from midnight until 1 a.m. When administration found that out, they immediately retrained staff because of the liabilities associated with that. If something bad had happened, this allows you to prevent that. We've stopped numerous thefts. The University of Iowa implements our system. We've saved them hundreds of thousands of dollars in preventing thefts, preventing vandalism, uh, even labor efficiencies. In this case, uh, that's a high target area because of the inflationary cost of building materials. We've probably stopped 20 plus thefts there. This was also the inspiration for uh, turning on vehicle detection because we could see the vehicle come up, right? Somebody hop out, try to cut in the fence, then we could see the police chase them down. And so we coded up and added to the platform at no additional cost the ability to detect vehicles, which helps in this case, uh, illegal dumping is a big deal and they get alerts then to say that, hey, somebody's pulling up to the dump, go investigate it, it may be illegal dumping. You can use it for restricted areas, you can use it to understand did somebody come in the parking lot between three and five a.m., those kind of things. Then lastly, a little bit of a humorous one, we can also detect that the kid is sliding down the banisters. <laughs> <laughs> but um, given that, again, I wanna thank you for the time, but also wanted to answer any questions with regard to the system because we're implementing a pilot with the district um, and hope to continue to help make this school a safe, great place to uh, learn. What questions can I ask? Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I, I really appreciate have, um, seeing the innovative, innovative solutions to these issues. I was, I was just curious if you have any data on the sensitivity and specific, specificity of this technology. Um, for instance, is, um, it, will it be triggered if you know, uh, a student makes a gun, you know, right, like they hold the form, yeah, exactly, right. like, like that. Um, uh, have there been instances where anything has been missed? I'm just uh, curious if you have any data on the sensitivity and specificity. Yes, um, and please let me know if I answer this the, the way you're asking. The, the standard challenges for us, and we are very, very open with what are the strengths and the limitations. So as an example, a limitation is if the camera can't see it, we can't see it, right? So this is not a system to detect the weapon that's in the backpack, okay? As soon as they pull it out, we can detect that. There are physical limits uh, with regard to the physics of optics <coughs> is what we call it. And so if the room is completely dark, the camera can't see it and we can't see it. If it's 50 feet away and it's obscured, then we wouldn't be able to see it. There are situations where hopefully you will only get what's called a false positive on weapons where something looked like a weapon, okay? So this is the example that I would give you, right? If I'm doing this and pointing it at the superintendent and the camera saw it, we may send out an alert on that. 
what we found is most people appreciate it because it keeps everybody aware. And um, in the packet, there was an example of a, a visual situation where somebody's leaving the restroom and what they were holding looked like a shotgun. That was a real life situ situation. It happened to be an umbrella. But the recipient of that alert actually said thank you because it keeps us on our toes. Now statistically, that's where it gets into a challenge because one false positive out of 10 million frames analyzed is an extremely low percent, but it's still a false positive. We do have a system that allows you to then report that because our system actually gets smarter and more intelligent the more it consumes. And that's the, the science of the deep learning AI. Did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, using the same example, if the student that had came out of a restaurant with an umbrella, was that student's identity then made known to some way? No, or we, not from us, for sure, right? We don't retain any of that. There's no what's called PII, personally identifiable information on our system. You decide who gets those alerts. And so in that case, a staff member would have received that alert and would have been able to understand, okay, hey, this is the situation, here's where it's going on, let me look, it's not a real threat, um, let me address it then accordingly. Did that answer your question, sir? It answered the question, it doesn't quite answer my concern. So I mean, my question wasn't very good. So, so Matt, what, what would be the district's uh, privacy obligations in that instance to the, to the student being identified in a video frame? Or my yeah, I'm not sure if there'd be a privacy concern there. I mean, I think of another example we had, you know, a week or so ago at one of the high schools where we thought maybe the student had a weapon and it was actually a cell phone under their shirt, right? Well, we still responded in that because a staff member saw it and reported it. So similar here, we'd have a piece of technology would report it, an administrator would intervene in that situation, handle it appropriately. And so the same thing here, I think what Scott is saying, it's not that the technology is capturing any privacy information and we trust our building-based staff with privacy information all the time. So if they respond to that concern and then it's a non-issue, um, or even if it is an issue, right, we're gonna follow our appropriate procedures and policies from there. So I don't think there's a larger privacy concern from that aspect other than what we already do every day and the information we trust our staff with. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, but in this case, there's a video of that incident. Yeah, and which we'd already is, have video of that is, incident, yeah. most likely, right? Because he's saying that the video is already there. What the what this is just doing is just alerting us that there's something on the video that we should check out. So we're already capturing video of our students every single day. This isn't doing additional video. This is basically oh, okay. watching the video and telling us if there's something that's problematic that we should respond to. And so, Charlie, I guess I would add to Matt is our approach on that when those situations occur Right, we don't continue to log our video, but if there is an incident that captures a student, we would then immediately consider that part of the student record, and so it would then fall under FERPA and have the FERPA protections once that video was captured, and we would approach a student to try to resolve the situation. If it was an adult, an employee, the same way. It would become a, a personnel record if we had to address it, investigate it. And so um, those are the parameters we already have in place. And so yes, while the people would get alert, they would already be in that chain of need to know under our FERPA guidelines, but then we would provide that same protection in that circumstance as we would if we went back and looked at a video today without the IntelliSE technology sitting on top of it. And I think Scott might have mentioned this, but they don't keep any of the video at IntelliSE. And so it's not like we have a copy of the video and they have a copy of the video. My understanding is the only frames that are even flagged or if there is something that's captured and that's sent to us. But yeah, it's, alert, it's, right. it's not that they are then banking all of this, um, this video off-site. It's, it's our video that, that we still own. Absolutely. Yeah. Sir, if, um, has that been one of the criticisms we've heard from community members about other instances where there is a record of what a student uh, is engaged in? And then the video that, um, and the private company that generates all that says they don't keep it, but community members are not uh, sometimes not convinced that that is in case that's exactly the case. I mean, I think there's always that concern about um, 
people wanting us to be transparent, and so we try to be upfront in our policies and our procedures um, when videos are requested. Um, to talk again honestly and transparently about how long we backlog videos when we do capture them, because we do get a number of community requests um, from individuals for video that's uh, been taken in our schools. And so we try to just run those through the same process, redact individuals from those videos when we feel like they need to be redacted because of the privacy concerns that exist. And so this, again, I don't think changes any of those parameters that we have in place when a video would be requested or how we would archive it. It simply helps us detect potentially a, a dangerous situation earlier and helps us address it. And if I could jump in really quick, Director Eastham. Um, also, I want to clarify that our video is recorded entirely on premises with servers that we maintain, and that would not change with the implementation of IntelliC. So the IntelliC appliances would be on prem. So we're not sending any video outside of the district whatsoever. So it really sounds like instead of like the old school. Um, command center where you have a body sitting and watching video and we pay somebody to do, we don't do that now but you would have to pay somebody to sit in a chair and watch the video in real time we're just letting the ai take the place of that human and do technology-based monitoring for us but nothing else changes um, do the alerts go, can, do they go to like a mobile, like to an app on a phone for our administrators that often move through the building? Yes, yes. So what you can do is you can set up uh, the alerts to go either to a cell phone, to an email, to another system. Uh, so to, to both their comments here, we're not trying to replace your video management system, mm -hmm. right? We're trying to enhance it. And so one of those alerts can be to say, okay, look, something's going on here attention and record that so you don't erase it and then you use all your normal standard operating procedures from there and you say you're currently with the University of Iowa you have technology there and how many other school districts are you working with so we just started but in Iowa we've got a private k-12 we've got a large uh, Waukee my school right okay <laughs> Um, we've got a uh, community college, a uh, university, <coughs> several hospitals are starting up as well. So. Uh, and then in Illinois and uh, out east, we've got some schools. Great, thank you. After the initial purchase of the technology, is there any additional cost? Is there a subscription uh, to sustain this, or how does that work? So there are two costs that are involved. The first is a one-time expense of hardware. Okay, and, and the school can supply that, or we can, we can provide it as a cost pass to them. Once that's done, you don't have to spend that again. Then there's an annual subscription to the software as a service uh, fee. And that's just, and that can be um, baked in as a three year thing or one year, however you guys want to do it. I, I assume that depends upon the size of the institution or the number of buildings that are served. Okay. Yes, it's, it's ultimately how many cameras are you going to track because that drives the hardware cost as well as the software. I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head uh, around the, the downside. Um, so I guess unless it's going to start to replicate itself and, and try to you know replace our administrators, um, I'm not concerned. I like the way you know Director Williams said it's it's just the person sitting in front of the screen, but it's software and it's happening all the time, and it's um, doesn't come with the, the downsides of. Um, you know, having to pay a person to sit in front of a screen. So to me, it just takes what we've got. We've already invested in all of these cameras, and it actually makes them a lot more useful other than, oh, hey, somebody heard this thing happened over here. Let's go check the cameras and see what's there. Instead, it's going to alert us. So it, um, again, yeah, trying to think through, I, you know, I really appreciate the privacy concerns, you know, that it's not retaining that information, that there's no facial recognition, um, and that it's all housed in, uh, in, in our system, so I think uh, then the only question is what our what our standard operating procedures are, and are we protecting FERPA? And then I think that's in our control. So, thanks for the presentation, and I you know think this looks like a really innovative uh, system that helps us use the technology we've already got uh, more effectively. So, I think the next step, what we would be asking is Scott referenced wanting to do a pilot with us, is that we would like to pilot this. 
uh, in the district. And so at the next meeting, we'd present you with the contract for that to kind of Director Finch's questions about the cost. So you would kind of get to see the cost structure and what we would um, be working with there. And so that we could try it at some buildings and, you know, kind of feel out how do those alerts work and how does it go. Um, but we also saw this as a, a good con uh, continuation of the conversation around safety and security that we had. We know some of the things we're not interested in as a district, but this seems like a tool that uh, would be of interest to us. And so that's why we really wanted Scott here to deliver the presentation rather than just reading a contract cold. You guys had had some good questions ahead of that. And I think this, you know, just from Chase and I's opportunity to listen to him a couple times, this does a nice job of being able to explain it and show and address the same concerns that we asked him about the first time. Uh, we had uh, a conversation with them around it, um, but I think if we're supportive and I see heads nodding, then that would be the next step that at the next meeting we'd bring you a contract to consider for, for the pilot opportunity. So my, my questions about that, just as you guys are working on that, um, on the proposal, is it'll be interesting to see, you know, what buildings you choose and how you choose them because that's, a, that's part of your consideration, so we'll, we'll want to talk about that and um, the cost, obviously. And I'm just thinking about, you know, as board members looking at this new technology for new problems or, more, or, or um, threats that perhaps are more severe than they have been historically, I'm thinking about how we got the, um, that medication for the opioid mm -hmm. overdose. Narcan. I can't, what's it called again? Narcan. 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 Yeah. Um, you know, and how we talked about that was, look, we don't, we don't have that problem right now, but we are trying to anticipate ways to make our kids s safe. So I think that's how I, I can understand this is sort of um, worth a try. Again, it keeps our kiddos safe. And I mean, what I took away, one of the things that captured my attention was something that we do see often in our buildings with not only our staff, but with our students, it d detects potential areas of slip and falls. Mm -hmm. And those can be not only physically costly to our people, but to a district. And so that to me, I think if that's a layer of protection that it can provide, I think it's worth the opportunity of piloting just to see if it's effective in preventing those type of incidents. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's the number one reason why insurance companies are interested in us. <laughs> well, and if you read the pre-read, I think there's some other areas or examples that Scott didn't cover. Like one of the things we talked about is if your front area is left vacant for a couple hours with no one's there, the camera can detect that no one's there. So if a door is left open, we oh. can set the sensitivity to let us know that a door is open. And all the alerts don't have to go to the same people. So for a slip and fall, the custodian can get that alert rather than going to the principal and then the custodian. And so it allows that response time. Um, and so we are anxious too to see kind of what are the different things that we can utilize it for in a variety oh, wait, of I'm sorry, Dr. Areas. Rainey. So did you just say that certain alerts can be programmed to be sent to certain people? Yes. yes. Oh, that's yes. great. Absolutely. Yes. Well, uh, to, uh, yeah, to that's great. Like you also have escalation abilities. So let's say that a spill is detected and that a first alert goes to janitorial services and it's still there five minutes later, mm -hmm. then that can escalate to another recipient. And that it detects if a door is accidentally propped open, left open, and alerts are sent. I... Look, the other thing that we want is ideas, right? Mm -hmm. Because you all are the ones that are living the risks and what you face. And that example of vehicle detection, right, that was brought to us. <coughs> we work with a hospital that, with their behavior department, they actually train patients to do push ups if they're agitated. We now alert them when a patient is agitated. So it's those kind of capabilities we want to hear from you all. You know, it would be interesting about if they if they can um, if it can detect running, people running, for example, through a hallway. Now yeah. some, but something something like that. I just think this is going to be interesting for us to learn about. Mm -hmm. Again, cost matters. Right. Um, but the concept is pretty intriguing and impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I'd leave you with is as we add things. Yeah, I, I, I agree that I think this is an interesting, this is an intriguing approach, and as I'm sure you know. Uh, but what about, uh, how, how do you deal with clients uh, in terms of uh, 
detecting and quantifying your false negatives. I mean, s s <coughs> liquid spills are fine, but I'm not sure that the system can detect 90% of the liquid spills right, that are occurring. Right, right, right. Okay, so how do, how do we work together so that we figure out what the negatives are, the percentages are, yeah. and how to deal with them? So uh, to your point, first off, false positives and false negatives are the two things that we work the hardest at. So false negatives is, is something happened but the system didn't detect it. And a false positive is we detected something that didn't really happen. Right? And both of those we have processes around. One of the challenges on false negatives is we don't know if it happened because our system didn't detect it. We have to rely on folks like you to tell us mm -hmm. if something happened that we missed. Right. The brilliance of the AI, um, and this is where we actually, our, our new senior AI person, we just moved from Turkey here, um, but they take that information and they retrain the neural network and then it learns from there. So the cheesy line I use, this isn't like a car engine where the more miles you put on it, the worse it gets. Our AI engine, the more miles you put on it, the smarter it gets. Mm -hmm. And that's fascinating to me. And I'm not a technologist. Yeah, I wish that applied to me. But I'm <laughs> <laughs> On that note, Charlie, uh, the Director Eastham, are there any other questions? <laughs> okay. Thank you so Thank much you. for spending time with us tonight. And Superintendent Degner, I think um, at the next meeting you can you and your team can bring forth the next steps. Great. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you again for what you're doing for the community. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Scott. Next for presentations, we have um, our treasurer, Les Finger. So I don't know if you wanna take them one at a time or both at the same time, but the first one is the financial health report and car report. Les, I just have one thing before you okay. get going oh. here, buddy. Um, so we're going to have a few different financial documents uh, here in front of you on the agenda in the next few minutes, and we do have a work session afterward it's to talk about budget. Um, there's probably going to be some information that generates questions, um, and so I might encourage you to write those questions down and that we can have that conversation in there, unless there's something that gives you pause on us proceeding in the way we are now without it being clarified. So um, I just don't want us to get lost in one of these reports and then uh, something that'll be covered in that larger conversation in the work session. So um, Les will walk through the reports. I know there's gonna be some overlap in the information. Like I said, that, that was one thing I hope we could do is have the kind of save a lot of the conversation to the work session and again, unless there's something that makes you really uncomfortable that you see right now. Great, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Um, the, the first two reports are the financial health and the car comparison report. Um, kind of refer to those as the autopsy of the last fiscal year that was completed on June 30th. And so it recaps some of the comparative data, uh, key information from that year. Uh, and looking at the financial uh, health report, I'd probably uh, point you to the page that has the color-coded uh, red, yellow, and green. Um, you know, just like a stoplight, they're probably the same uh, message that you're getting. And so you'll see several that are green, which means uh, we've pretty much held our own there or there's still positive trends. Um, you know, there's a couple then that are, are uh, yellow, which means that they're probably caution areas. So if you look at the employee cost ratio that was yellow last year and turned to red this year, um, that's not necessarily um, a bad thing in this situation because our district has a long history of about 85 cents of every dollar being spent on personnel costs. Last year's dropped to 82 percent because we had uh, the influx of the one-on-one -on -one technology spent with ESSER dollars, so that technology brought down um, costs, brought down our employee cost last year. It was a temporary uh, thing, and I believe I probably delivered that message last year when we saw that change. So that one, I'm not terribly worried about going back to the red, other than it's always um, a caution as to how much we spend on our people, but we are a people organization. So just, um, just to keep that one in line. Uh, the investment income ratio, that one's really out of our control. As we know, uh, interest rates were historically low over the last two years. That's rebounded, so I expect that one to turn into more closer to a yellow category uh, next year moving forward as we've gotten better. So the two that are really left uh, there are the financial solvency ratio and the unspent balance ratio. 
Um, the unspent balance ratio we'll see later in the quarterly financial report, and that will be also be uh, something that will drive our conversation later tonight uh, in the work session, as Matt alluded to. So, um, and then the, the rest of the pages of that report just walk through each one and show the numbers and the comparison and kind of what the trend is and what the corrective action is. And I think uh, we're working on all of those, any that needed corrective action, uh, things have already been implemented are in, are in place. The other one is the CAR comparison report. Uh, that's just pulled some key numbers out of uh, the report that's sent to the Department of Education on September 15th of each year uh, from the district business office. Um, you know, there's some numbers there that are negative and you are minus percentages like the outstanding debt obligations. Well, that's an indication that we're paying down our debt. It doesn't mean it's a, it's a bad one. So just, just need to have those things in context as you look at them. Um, and then just working through the rest of those numbers in a comparison to over the last three years. Um, you know, probably the key one there is uh, just our expenditures have been going up because of ESSER dollars in, uh, put into the system and then kind of that mix between the revenues and you see the jump uh, in the federal sources there, which is the, the ESSER dollars. So um, with that, I'll pause uh, and see if there's any questions you want to ask at this point. Or otherwise, I'll move forward and you can leave your questions till later. So. I just have a general question, Les, which you can't answer. Uh, <laughs> is, is it really realistic for a district to have a 10%, to, to, those two key ratios, to be 10%? Does any district in the state have those what, ratios at 10%? For the unspent balance ratio? Yeah, or? unspent balance, and what was the other one? I don't remember. Uh, the solvency ratio? Yeah, right. Uh, yes, it, it is possible, and there are districts that have uh, unspent, ratio, unspent balance ratios over 20%. Some, I've heard some as high as 40%. What does that mean? It means you're not using your district resources that the state has given you to serve your kids on a consistent basis. Right. Yeah. Now, so zero is not necessarily wanting to be because you always want to have a little bit in savings, right? I mean, we went into a pandemic and we needed to use those savings and that's a little bit of what this is showing. Um, but to have that much sitting there and not being used to educate the kids, um, I personally am going to say that I don't think that's a good idea for a school district to do, but there is that whole range across the state of Iowa. So as a policy matter, we could actually choose to have those ratios smaller. We could. You could choose wherever they want, but you, it's what you have to be comfortable with and what you can operate with. Um, but as a $200, or $200 million organization in the general fund, it does need to have a little bit of reserves, yeah, and we're... Right. Right. We're at a, at a very low level right now. Right. Okay. Thanks. Are there any additional questions or can he continue? All right. And, and the next one is the first quarter report, which is actually would be September 30th. Um, I apologize. This usually comes out a little bit earlier, but I was gone at the last meeting, so uh, we're a little bit late. Uh, so we're almost through the second quarter already. Um, the first quarter is always a little bit wonky uh, for a real technical term there, but uh, you know our teachers don't get paid for the first time in the, in the fiscal year until September 15th, and so there's only one twelfth of their contracts paid in this quarter versus another quarter. So um, that's different than the administrators and some of our year-round staff, which would be 25%. So some of the numbers are not going to look like you might think they should at a fourth of the way through the year. Same way with the state aid, if you're looking at the revenues, they pay September through June, so there's only gonna be 10% of those 10 payments there. So some of those numbers are just a timing type thing, and that's why we show some of the comparative information on the detail between the two years, so you can see if there's anything that's a little bit out of line. Uh, some of the federal sources are, uh, again, in that wonky category because of the ESSER dollars and which programs we have. Some were only for one year, some were for two years, some were for three years of the ESSER uh, funding. Uh, so the unspent balance, which is always the page that I, I try to focus you to, um, this will be the page that we will focus on in the work session um, later as we project and has the, you know, coming out of fiscal year 22, the very low unspent balance uh, and where we're projecting going forward. So um, with that, I'll entertain any questions on that. Um, Any questions or you guys want to save them for the work session? 
I, ju I just want to say how much I appreciate your reports um, you and your explanations because you, you really, ex for someone with, like me who I, this is not my thing, um, you really explain it very well and it uh, makes it easy to understand. So I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, with that, that concludes our presentations and we can move into our action items. And um, the first one is the resolution to approve application for modified supplemental amounts for increased enrollment. Back to, I don't know if Superintendent Degner wants to say anything or can we turn it over to Les? Yeah, I think for um, most of these, they should be self-explanatory based on earlier conversations. We're happy to answer your question, but those first through is just really about uh, trying to gain the additional funding we can for those different categories that are listed there. There's no discussion or questions. I would entertain a motion. I move that we approve the application for modified supplemental amounts for increased enrollment. Second. Kim, we're ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Next up, we have the resolution to approve application for modified supplemental amounts for LEP instruction beyond five years. Are there any discussions or questions or? If not, I would entertain a motion. I move that we approve the application for modified supplemental amounts for LEP instruction beyond five years. Second. Kim, we're ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Next up is the resolution to approve application for modified supplemental amounts for open enrollment out. Is there any further discussion or questions? If not, I would entertain a motion. I move that we approve the application for modified supplemental amounts for open enrollment out. Second. Kim, we're ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Next up is um, our 200 series policies that we discussed earlier today. Is there any further discussion? If not, I would entertain a motion. I move that we approve the 200 series. Second. Kim, we're ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Next up is policy 501.14, open enrollment transfer procedures as ascending district. If there's no further discussion, I would entertain a motion. I move that we approve the 501.14 open enrollment transfers procedures as ascending district. Second. Kim, we're ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Next up is policy 501.15, open enrollment transfer procedures as a receiving district. If there's no further discussion, I would entertain a motion. I move that we approve 501.15, open enrollment transfers procedures as a receiving district. Second. Kim, we're ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Next up is policy 504, student fundraising. 
there's no further discussion on that item, I would entertain a motion. I move that we approve uh, policy 504 student fundraising. Second. Kim, we're ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Next up is our strategic plan and I would turn it over to Superintendent Degner for further comment. Thank you, President Malone. Uh, I just thought it was important that we go ahead and project this up here and uh, have a public commitment to uh, our new strategic plan. Uh, you are helpful in our conversation uh, at our last meeting uh, when we delivered the annual progress report and did some goal setting work around our uh, three uh, five-year strategic plan goals of equity, proficiency, and growth. And you see those uh, stipulated there. I won't read them uh, verbatim for you, but you can tell we have some targets and uh, we have a direction and uh, we have some goals to keep the main thing, the main thing in the district and to keep our work aligned. Uh, and then we also have uh, strategies and measurement tools to hold ourselves accountable to those about if we're committed to the right work and staying on focus in those different areas. Um, those four areas are school culture, student learning, workforce, and systems and resources. Um, Kristen did a nice job of offsetting some of our visioning documents there that really set our course and our direction for how we're going to do that work uh, with our HRS implementation, our comprehensive diversity equity inclusion plan, our uh, comprehensive school improvement plans or CSIPs, portrait of a graduate, portrait of an educator, and facility master plan uh, 2.0. So we're excited to unveil this. I think it's a much more consumable <laughs> strategic plan and an easier read for the public about when they say, what are your goals? What are you working on? What are the important things for the Iowa City Community School District? I think this tells our story. This tells the work that we're doing. Um, and as we move forward, if there's things that aren't on here that we decide are important work or important strategies to employ, then we should update this. Um, and if we have an, or if we, make a mistake and we get too far off course, this should be our anchor point to redirect us back to what we committed to, uh, to um, for the school district. Uh, then it also provides us a, an opportunity to measure ourselves about how we're doing in terms of these goals, which I think is important and um, kind of a courageous task. I mean, I think that's hard for school districts to take on and be accountable to at some point, but if we never measure ourselves up against something, I don't think we're really talking about success measures. And, and these aren't all inclusive about what success looks like. I think that'll be part of our job to say too, here's our big goals. What are the other indicators? What are the other data points that show whether or not we're having success and starting to move the needle in some of these areas? So we wanted to put it in front of you for approval because I think it's that important and I think you guys think it's that important. Um, and then of course we'll get this posted on the webpage and, and start um, disseminating to our buildings and, and talking to them about the goals and looking for that alignment that we know we've already worked hard over the last several years to, to have included in our uh, comprehensive school improvement plans uh, so that that vision is aligned and the work is, is all uh, creating some synergy. So any questions you have on it or, or how it looks? I don't have any questions. I mean, we've, been, we've reviewed this very carefully mm -hmm. and very thoroughly. And I'm frankly delighted to serve on the school board that is considering adopting this kind of a strategic plan. Uh, I, I do think it's uh, important for me to ask uh, the uh, teaching and instructional staff uh, to join with us uh, as we work on this plan and can try to carry it out and to tell the students of the district that we are going to work our very hardest to bring this district into, uh, uh, into compliance with the plan and to help uh, and to better serve all the students that are with us. Thank you, Director Easton. Yes, agreed. If there's no further discussion, I would open it up to entertain a motion. I move that we approve the strategic plan. Second. Kim, we're ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. And the last action item for tonight is a resolution approving exhibits for SBRC presentation. There's uh, no... Sorry, I was just gonna give one, uh, just one explanation point so we understand what this one is. Um, so 
we have to appear in front of the school budget review committee mm -hmm. because uh, to Director Easton's point and what Les was explaining about our unspent balance being relatively thin for the current budget cycle, uh, we're in at 2.37% if you would take out our categorical funds. Um, that would put us into a, a position that the, the state finds uncomfortable, right? And we know that we've operated a pretty thin margin on that unspent balance and that we've put those resources into our students. Uh, but this is their check, so they kind of avoid it, another situation like they had from a district down the road where they spent into the negative and then had a problem. So they're catching a few more districts um, just in some of their compliance checks to make sure they're doing the appropriate things. Of course, as we're going to have a conversation in the work session, they'll have some more questions for us this year, too, about what the plan is as they forecast our budget forward, too. So why don't you be aware of what you're approving there and why they're in front of you, because we are going to have to make that appearance and, and have that conversation. So that's what's in front of you here this evening. I don't have a whole lot to add to, to Matt's comments other than uh, it, the SBRC has increased their reviews over the last two years uh, pulling this data. Um, and, and that's a good thing for the state of Iowa and education in general. So we just happen to be one of those districts that's gotten, you know, kind of caught in this review. Um, these are the documents that we'll be submitting to them. Um, but as uh, Dr. Klein at the DE liaison to the SBRC has told me repeatedly, no matter whenever we make a request, the important thing is every district has their own story to tell. And so the narrative is going to be what's important, and that's what we've tried to share in a couple of the letters. But it's extremely difficult to talk numbers uh, in these letters. So hopefully you've been able to understand and digest them. Um, Matt and I and Chase have had numerous conversations about this and about the information in, contained in it. So, um, you know, that would be the comments that I'd share. But when we do, uh, you know, present this information to them, uh, our narrative to them will tell the Iowa City story and why, we've, why we're where we're at and where we're going. And we'll have that will be part of our narrative as we'll explain to you later in the work session as well. Thank you. And, I, you know, reviewing that, I do have confidence that as you all sit in front of the board, um, you'll be able to share our story as a district and answer any questions that they may have or concerns. So I'm fully supportive of the information that you're providing us tonight on what you will share with that board. Is there any additional questions or comments? I just say, President Mullen, I'll echo what you said, that, that I have confidence and, and I appreciate the level of detail, um, the way you folks present it to us and then explain it um, gives me that. Cause, and I know we operate razor thin and I'm somebody who's for a very long time been supportive of that 85% um, that we put it because it goes into our teachers, because it goes into our students and because that's how we know we can impact students is through our staff. And you know, unless you say it every time, we're a people organization. This is why we're spending the money. So I'm confident, in one, that we're doing the right thing. I don't, don't want to say I'm looking forward to the conversation we have, but I trust <laughs> it'll be an in-depth conversation. And, and even if we have to make hard decisions, I trust what you folks bring us. So I just appreciate it. And have, you know, just as a board member sitting up here representing the community, have full faith that you guys are going to go down to SBRC and be able to tell that story um, because we're doing the right things. And you guys can communicate that. So. I appreciate that, that full confidence um, because of the work you guys folks do every day. Okay, if there's no further discussion, I would open it up for a motion. I move that we pass the, uh, we approve the exhibits for the SBRC presentation. Second. Kim, we're ready to vote. Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thank you. Next up is agenda setting. Um, it looks like there's an operation committee agenda for the 13th. It should be noted that if everything goes well for the annual meeting, this would be reflective of the new operations committee members. So um, I know, I don't know if there's any additions or anything folks want to add. I, I would just add that that's the meeting that we invite the entire board to. So it's not just the three of us that are on ops committee. That is our annual invitation. We are going to talk about budget. So I hope that all seven of us um, can be there. Uh, it's also my birthday, so I'll bring cookies. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we can make that work. Okay, next up is our regular agenda um, for that night. 
and we have our normal standard public forum items, consent agenda, and will there be additional presentations added? Our up equity up update, is there anything folks would like to see? Um, I'd be interested in um, a update from special education, and I don't know if it needs to be at this meeting, but um, soon, uh, I know at the beginning of the year there was a lot of concerns about not enough paras being hired. There's been a new process um, introduced as part of the IEP to um, help with that, and um, you know, just an update on um, s staffing and maybe um, the new IEP process that's got put, been put in place, and whatever else Ashley thinks we ought to know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Also, uh, Matt, I may be being a bit clumsy here, but we received a, a communication from an elementary school uh, class that asked us to help with a project they were doing on a, a recycling plasticware in the uh, uh, food programs. And I, I think we were going to check with that teacher to see if maybe they would uh -huh. come and do an equity yeah. showcase or something. I think you're right, yeah, because they were going to come tonight and uh, do community comment because of the all state. They decided to wait till December. So um, maybe they we'll are have an looking... additional ed showcase item, but yeah we'll, yeah, we'll try to get them here in December. Okay, yep. great. Thanks. All right. I don't know, Superintendent Dugner, was there anything else for that one or we can. I would have just re-emphasized the point that Director Williams made that I think after the follow-up to our conversation here at the work session will be the operations committee and so probably just yeah. encouraging folks to try to be there for that five o'clock meeting that evening. Will do. Okay. That brings us to the adjournment of this meeting. Um, before we do that, I don't know if anybody has anything to add. If not, I would entertain a motion. Move that we adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right, thanks. Do you all want to take a couple of minutes break before we dive into our annual meeting?